Good afternoon. My name is Jennifer Ryback and I am the VP of Programming for the Dallas Women Lawyers this year. I am so honored and excited to um, get to have a conversation with Chrissy Castle today. And Chrissy, you are so well known in the bar. Um, everybody knows your infectious personality and your pink suits and um, all the joy that you bring to all that you do. But I'm excited to get to know a little bit more about your story some of your background and uh, in particular for our women uh, members, how you've gotten to where you've gotten with your practice and all that you've accomplished so far. So we're gonna dive right in and really start at the very beginning and kind of just an open-ended, you know, what was your childhood like? What, you know, where'd you grow up and, and what, you know, what was that like? Oh, well, I grew up in El Paso, Texas. I technically was born in Tucson, Arizona, but my family moved to El Paso when I was about five years old. Um, my mom kind of dilly-dallied, for lack of a better description, and put me in kindergarten when I was six and a half years old. She tried to get them to let me, I tried to get her to let me skip a grade. The school tried to get her to let me skip a grade, and they would not. So I think I was... Uh, lucky in that I was older than most of my peers and uh, being the oldest of seven children I was rather bossy but also rather uh, responsible and mature so I always was the teacher's pet the most well-behaved person in the class um, and recently I attribute that to the fact that I was about a year older than everyone else was so I uh, really loved school and uh, had opportunities to skip grades as I progressed forward. And my mother always prevented me from skipping a grade. She said, you can stay home one more year with me before you leave to go to college. So uh, yeah, as a mom of babies, I, I get that. <laughs> what, what was it like? You said the oldest of seven? Yes. Wow. What was that like? Um, it was good and bad. Um, I was the only girl and I really did not like it when I was younger. I cried when my fourth brother and my fifth brother were born because they were boys and not girls. Um, I wanted a little sister and I never really got a little sister. Um, I got all these brothers. Um, looking back, I think it was really great. Uh, my younger brother that was right under me, 15 months younger, knew how to live life and have fun. And as we got older, I learned quite a bit from him. I was <laughs> how to have fun. How to have fun, because I was studious and kind of nerdy. <laughs> That's hard to imagine now, Chrissy. So <laughs> what, what made you decide to go to law school? Was that something that you thought about when you were younger or what, how did that come about? Probably a couple different ways. My grandfather graduated number one in his class from Creighton Law School, my paternal grandfather. And he uh, got a job, I believe, at Phelps Dodge and uh, didn't really particularly care for being an attorney because he felt that the employer at the time, and I don't know who it was, and I'm not even sure it was Phelps Dodge. So if you're watching this and you're associated, don't be offended. This is many years ago. And my story's very uh, secondhand, but he said he just didn't feel that people were being as ethical as he would have liked them to be. So he ended up leaving the practice of law and opening up his own business. Um, his experience uh, really made most of my family have a distaste for lawyers, uh, but for whatever reason, I really loved the law and maybe it was a kindergarten teacher that saw me and a girlfriend carrying a stack of books that were almost taller than we were. And we said, this is what we're gonna do when we go to college. And she said, that looks like a lot of books. I think you're gonna be hanging, I think you're gonna be handling all those books when you're in law school. And I kind of just thought from that moment on, so I had to be about six, uh, that I was gonna be a lawyer. And it never really left me. And so as you, you know, kind of grew up and, and did all the things, you know, through school, through college, et cetera, what, 
what solidified that decision to go to law school when you finally, you know, got to the, the age uh, to apply? I think a couple different things. I, in high school, was on the debate team and the drama team and the cheerleading team and all kinds of extracurricular activities, the volleyball team, the band, all kinds of different things. Um, but I had a teacher who really was instrumental in uh, demanding, I was part of the mock trial team, part of the debate team and told me, I think you really need to go to law school. So when I started college, I decided to be a political science major, English literature minor and uh, vice versa. I actually decided initially to be an English literature major, political science minor, and I was gonna teach if I decided law school wasn't gonna be for me. And the more I got involved in college and the more I took law classes, I realized that being a lawyer is probably something that I have always had always wanted to do. And I met a teacher at UTEP who was determined to make sure I went to law school. And he did everything in his power uh, to make sure I did what I needed to do to make that a reality. So I uh, thought about being a broadcaster, always thought about being a teacher, uh, thought about maybe going into politics, but ultimately I decided as a lawyer, uh, I can be a teacher, I can be a politician, I can be an entrepreneur, um, I can be an actress to some degree. So I, I got to be my jack of all trades that I often got um, accused of being in, in high school and it kind of worked out okay in the long run. Yeah, so talk about, I know one of the things that you and I discussed um, before we you know, sat down today is how different it is for the better for women in our profession. And so when you were in law school, it was the late nineties, right? Um, so, you know, not as challenging as it was for women in the seventies or the sixties, but what was it like to be a woman in law school in, in the late nineties? Interesting. Um, I think that I was oblivious to the fact that being a woman might've uh, been an impediment to my success in school. Uh, I don't think I'd ever really experienced that. Uh, growing up as the only girl, always studious, elementary school, high school, college in El Paso, never really any issues. Um, at least none that I can really say in, were an impediment to my learning. There were always things, but in law school, it was interesting, it was visible. And I don't think that the female professors meant to do this. Uh, they often chose the men, they often picked the men. Uh, they judged me for my fluorescent orange nails and my shorts. Um, for those that knew me in high school, I never wore a pair of jeans. I dressed like an old maid. People thought I was the teacher the first day of fifth grade. When I went to law school, I decided I wanted to have more fun. Uh, before I had to become a very serious lawyer. So um, law school was interesting because someone with blonde hair, and sometimes it's bleach blonde, uh, and males and shorts, I was judged a lot by professors and by my, my peers. And to a large degree, not taken seriously. Did that motivate you? I mean, almost make you want to defy that stereotype? Absolutely. Uh, there was one professor in particular, and she and I are great friends now, but at the time, Allie McBeal was very popular. I never saw Allie McBeal until many years after law school, so I had no idea what she or anyone else was referencing when they talked about it, mm -hmm. uh, but she said, these girls in their short dresses, and they're being silly, and they're going out to drink. That's just not how lawyers behave. And I was like, well, that seems to me what law school is all about, lady. When I came here, that's what they're doing. I had no idea what Allie McBeal was. Um, but, but I thought it was interesting because I think as women lawyers, as women law students, we really need to pay attention to how we dress, what we say, when we say it, and who we emulate. And, and I think that sometimes we can be judged too, too harshly uh, when we're in school, uh, 
let's just say I quickly decided to acknowledge the female students who liked Ally McBeal and try to balance it with the disdain that our professor had for the show. So <laughs> if that made any sense, uh, it was, it's, it's, it's a balance, I think, as women, you have to decide who you want to be and, and how you want to be and then, um, and then own it. Yeah, and when you were in law school, you were president of the women in law there at that time. Um, how did you get into that role? And do you remember anything about what that organization did back then? Our big event was a wine and cheese. And we had Justice Ann McClure come and speak. And I think Justice Ann McClure was one of several women, but she particularly stands out in that she dressed like a woman. Mm. She came to speak at our wine and cheese uh, and she wore a yellow suit. I mean, it was bright yellow. And I thought, oh, I was in my very conservative uh, gray, very conservative black or very conservative eggplant, almost black suit. Um, and she goes, I'm a woman, I'm gonna dress like a woman. And I, I remember that statement and I remember how great she looked and how well respected she was by our dean and by all the professors and students that attended that event. So we did that event that brought in a professional lawyer judge uh, to show young law students, particularly women, what the possibilities for their future were. Uh, but we also uh, did different programs on how to dress, what to wear, when to wear it. Um, and that's when I guess Allie McBeal became the topic of conversation. Um, we did CLEs. We talked about childcare and practicing law. We talked about marriage and practicing law. We talked about work-life balance and practicing law. Um, and we were a network and a support group for one another. So if one of us needed an outline, we'd share an outline. If one of us needed to go do something with our family or our friends, the rest of us would help her be ready for the exam or the quiz the next day um, or the, the remote chance that you'd be called on the one day you didn't read. Mm -hmm. So we really tried to, to help each other out. So, and I feel like that just knowing you personally, that's something you have carried forward. I mean, your friendships are so dear to you and you're that kind of person for so many in the profession. So it's interesting that that started, you know, for you in law schools, you know, before you even started practicing, you were that kind of, you know, colleague and friend. Well, I think it might've started long before law school. And I think it started with my mother and two really great friends that I went to school with and grew up with. And they were always encouraging me, supporting me and promoting me mm -hmm. and kind of seeing the good in me when I didn't see it in myself. Mm -hmm. So these two uh, female friends are both here in the DFW Metroplex area now. Uh, we all came here independently of one another and we still are friends today. Uh, but there were many years that we'd lost track of each other. And then my mother who is the promoter of everyone uh, who wanted to be an old maid school teacher and or a judge. She never wanted to have any children. <laughs> and she ended up with seven. Oh, man. And I don't think she regrets it. Uh, I don't think she'd change a thing. But um, she is very supportive of all of her children, but especially me. That's awesome. Um, where, so you graduated law school. Where, where did you practice right out of the gate? Where did you start? I applied for a job. Uh, I actually could have worked at uh, Legal Aid, Genesis Women's Shelter or something comparable. Uh, and then I saw a posting where there was a law firm that had a location in Dallas, El Paso, and unbeknownst to me, Wichita Falls. So I thought, well, I know what the other organizations are like. I know what it's gonna be like to go home and work the DA's office or go work in the public interest that I'd really focused on in law school. Um, I'd worked at a couple big firms uh, throughout, throughout school, and I thought, I'm going to try this. It said 
compensation commensurate with production. And I thought, well, that's something I can do. <laughs> so I applied for a job, I thought, to work in their El Paso office, hoping that I could get to their Dallas office as quickly as possible. Um, but when I interviewed, he said, oh, well, I just filled the El Paso position. I think we're gonna have to put you in Wichita Falls. And I'm like, what about Dallas? He goes, no, I need you in Wichita Falls. Oh, man. Said, uh, do they have a Dillard's? <laughs> I, I think they have a shopping mall. Uh, he goes, I'm not sure. I said, well, if they have a Dillard's, then I, I might consider moving there. If within the year I could go to Dallas. And he said, we might could work that out. So I went to Wichita Falls and practiced for Long Car and Associates. Um, I pretty much was uh, running an office on their nickel. Uh, they gave me some great sage advice. I got a lot of good experience and a lot of exposure. Um, but they gave me a lot of autonomy, mm -hmm. so that was helpful. And nothing wrong with Wichita Falls, but you eventually made it to Dallas. <laughs> yes, and I will say there is nothing wrong with Wichita Falls if you are married in the military or over the age of 60. Mm -hmm. But if you are a single 28-year-old uh, woman who has no ties to the military or the oil money and in uh, Wichita Falls, it was not the most fun place to be. So probably not the same nightlife as we have here. Yeah, yes. I worked all the time. So that made meeting people my age uh, all that more difficult. So was there a step in between long car and starting your own firm? Yes. Um, quite frankly, I started questioning why the men at the firm we're making double, triple, or sometimes five times what I was making. Mm -hmm. And um, it was a sign of the times. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really know how to question it in the most effective way. So I did it at a dinner party one night and it kind of got me in trouble because in those days you didn't really talk about what others made. Yep. And I really didn't know definitively but I made an educated guess and quickly got told, how do you know how much money I make? I said I didn't, but now I do. Yep. <laughs> the very next day, let's just say it wasn't good for me and I actually was asked to leave. They said, you don't talk about people's salaries here. Wow. Um, we worked out a, a, a reasonable uh, separation and then I, I ended up getting a job almost immediately at another plaintiff's personal injury firm, Bailey and Gallion, and uh, went to work for Philip Gallion, Brian Longhart, Texas Tech grad, mm -hmm. Philip Gallion, Texas Tech grad, uh, Chrissy Castle, Texas Tech grad. So uh, Philip and Brian both were, were great mentors. They taught me a lot about how to run a business, uh, particularly how to run a uh, a high volume personal injury practice. Mm -hmm. um, but they also let me explore areas that, that they really didn't want me exploring. I did get to try some cases, uh, but mostly I was a pre-litigation queen. Mm -hmm. um, when I asked for more litigation experience at Billingham, they asked, uh, again, we'll hire a man to replace you, but we're gonna pay him three times what we've been paying you. <laughs> So when I questioned that again, it, it caused some problems. Um, we had words, they said, well, let's see what happens. Maybe we'll pay you some more, but right now we're just not gonna do it. So I quickly got my decks in a row, had five different job offers and none of the men that wanted to hire me wanted to pay me what I was making mm -hmm. at the firm where I was getting paid less than most of the men. Yeah. So I had three cases that I brought with me to the firm. They were personal family friends. And I decided to start my own practice. And that was June of 2006, approximately 15 years ago. And when I first started, I did it the way they did it. I was conservative. I painted my walls green. I had browns. Uh, I tried to make my firm look like their firms had. Uh, and probably about five years in, I had a young lady that worked for me and she's like, you're a woman, you should just own it. You love red, but I think you need to pick pink as your color. 
She goes, think about it. No man will ever want pink as their law firm color. And I thought about it. And I said, you're right. And I like pink. So we decided to just go, we're an all female law firm and we're gonna own being women. And we're gonna wear bright colors and we're going to be as honest and as genuine, as sincere as we possibly can. We wanna try to treat every client like they're our only client. In reality, that's not always possible. Sure. But at Castle Law, that's what we wanna do. We wanna treat our clients like we treat our friends and neighbors. Mm -hmm. What do and you wish as women? As women, that's right. Wearing pink, backwards <laughs> in high heels, right? Right. <laughs> what do you wish, you know, if you could go back and tell yourself something at in 2006 when you were starting the firm, what advice or what what thing do you wish you knew then that you have either had to learn the hard way or or that you know now just by doing it for 15 years? I knew I needed case management software when I started this firm. I didn't feel I was big enough. I would definitely make sure I get case management software from day one. Mm -hmm. I would have planned opening my firm uh, a little bit more strategically. Uh, I might have not been as rash to go out on my own. Uh, but ideally, uh, my younger self is to just be competent in who you are and what you're all about. And if you work hard and show up, make sure those that have the decision-making power are aware of all that you're doing mm -hmm. for them. Whether it's your clients, your bosses, your teachers, I think that uh, it's important to make sure that those that are assessing you are fully aware of what you're doing. Do you think women don't tend to do that as often as men do? I think in this generation, your generation and younger, I think that they are doing a better job of that, probably because of organizations like DAYL, DBA, and the Dallas Women Lawyers. Mm -hmm. um, I really didn't get to participate in lawyer organizations for the first seven years of my practice because I was so busy working. And I thought by being a good worker, I would be a good, I thought I'd be a great lawyer. Mm -hmm. I think in order to be a great lawyer, you have to know what great lawyers are doing. And I think that my first seven years of practice, I put my head down, I worked hard, and I thought my employers, like my mother and my friends, would notice my efforts. Mm -hmm. And the reality is, is that now as a business owner, I see that sometimes you don't notice the efforts of those that are making things happen when you're extremely busy. Mm -hmm. And it is up to them to tell you what they have done and how they have done it and why you should compensate them well so or give them credit so i think that women are getting better and i think there's definitely a generation and i feel like i'm kind of in the middle of the women lawyers i know and i see how the people before me had to really fight mm -hmm. like men and be like men to get to where they're at. I feel like I've kind of learned through a process of trial and error that there's enough success for all of us mm -hmm. and pull people up uh, and bring them along. I think you're right too. I don't necessarily think there's a bad motive for the decision makers to not compensate or to not notice sometimes. I think it's more, you know, you're bringing cases in, you're trying cases, you're trying to keep all the things going and it is good when, when those who are doing good things in your firm bring that to your attention because you can get, you know, I don't think it's always for a bad motive that the senior lawyers forget to compensate the junior lawyers. I think sometimes you're just, you're just practicing law and you look up and, and maybe you lose somebody who's really great because you didn't know, you know, um, so that's a good point. For the younger lawyers, <laughs> make sure you, you, you know, bring that to your superiors. 
Well, and I think also you have to remember that your coworkers are trying to show that they're relevant and that they're worthy of compensation. So you have to remember that sometimes your friends aren't necessarily your best advocates when you're at work. Mm -hmm. So you have to know who the decision makers are and make sure they're aware of what you're doing and don't rely on others to promote you or support you. Although we should all promote and support one another, mm -hmm. uh, but we also have to be realistic that sometimes there's other motives and sometimes they're not evil. They're just your own sense of survival. Mm -hmm. People forget to recognize those that are, are doing the work. 100%, 100%. Um... You mentioned, you know, your first quite a few years of practice, you weren't able to be involved or, or just didn't prioritize bar organizations, but you've certainly made up for that um, in the years since then, uh, you know, being on the DAYL board, you were president of, of our organization, DWLA, president of Texas Women Lawyers, and you're set to be president of the Dallas Bar. So why has it been important, you know, once you kind of looked up and, you know, weren't down deep working all the time. Um, why has it been important to you to participate in those organizations? One, I love people. I love doing things for the community, but I think it's also uh, a necessary, uh, it's a necessary activity if you want to gain business. Uh, but more importantly, if you want to know what you're capable of and what's possible. Um, I didn't really know a lot of lawyers when I felt like I was being underpaid and I didn't go about it in the right way. I think if I had gone about it in the right way, I would have been compensated. Mm -hmm. I, I think that my employer had a lot pulling, at, he had a lot pulling at him. Sure. And I didn't make myself his priority. And, and I think there was a way to do that. So I think that organizations like DAYL put me in contact with lawyers who I trusted, who were like-minded, who now if I have an issue, I know so many lawyers I can get advice from and I know which lawyers to go to if I need to hire someone to help me get to where I wanna go. Mm -hmm. So I think organizations give me a sense of belonging, uh, a sense of community, gives me the opportunity to help others hopefully do it better than I have done it. But it also gives me the opportunity to do it better than I'm doing it by watching and learning from others. Mm -hmm. And along the way, one of the constants has been your involvement in women or women's organizations, you know, women in law and law school, DWLA, Texas Women Lawyers, you know, what I feel like, you know, obviously you're a huge supporter of women and you've obviously gotten um a lot out of those organizations. What what draws you to what draws you to those kinds of groups? I don't know for certain. I think that probably a lot of it was being the oldest girl of seven boys. Pardon me, the oldest girl of seven children, six younger brothers. Mm -hmm. I think that um, my brothers and I are very competitive, and we like to talk and compete and show, oh, I can run faster than you. I can jump faster than you. I'm smarter than you. We all are very competitive, but it was always the boys versus the girls and I was always outnumbered. So I think I just wanted, I want women to know how valuable they are. I think I don't want men to be discounted, uh, but I think that as a minority in my own family, and then as a minority in the law, and then as a minority in the law practice of personal injury, especially, um, there were a lot of things that were inherently unfair to me. And like I said, I don't, it was a function of the times, but I was not married and I had a longtime boyfriend and I was told he could not come on our company retreat and he was a lawyer and he loved the person I worked for, kind of idolized him. Um, but the male attorney that was hired two weeks before our firm retreat got to bring the girl he met at the bar the night before. <laughs> so when I see things like that and I feel like 
it was inherently unfair. I just feel like women need to have a place where they can feel safe, mm -hmm. talk about what's happened to them and, and be able to find counsel in ways in which to handle their situation in a way that will get them where they wanna go. Um, but also I think as women, we juggle a lot and we shouldn't be judged by the same standards as men when it comes to partnership tracks, et cetera. I think it's changing. I think men are taking on more of the child rearing roles and the taking care of the home roles. Um, and I've been super blessed by a husband that supports me 100%. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that women need, we have lots of women in all kinds of organizations, but I think women need an organization that will help them become who they want to be while they're still being moms and sisters and wearing pink suits and doing girl stuff because we don't have to be like the men to be successful. Yeah. 100%. And even to have a group to commiserate with or to celebrate with, right? You just have this almost like sisterhood that develops in these organizations that I don't know how you get through the hard days without sometimes, you know? No doubt that I would not be the trial lawyer I am without at least two of my very good friends talking to me at three o'clock in the morning, helping me write an opening at 3 a.m. or calling me on their way to work while I'm on my way to the courthouse saying, can I run my opening by you? It, it, it's really nice to have a girlfriend that you know you can trust that wants to see you do well and that will give you honest feedback. Mm -hmm. And uh, go have a drink with you uh, or come help you clean out your closet on a Friday night. <laughs> while having a drink, right? Yeah. <laughs> or two, right. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Um, what you know, you, the kinds of cases that you handle can be emotionally taxing. I mean, it's somebody's life, you know, um, it, the kinds of things that you see on a daily basis are serious. What, what drives you to do what you do and to, to fight for those people? Oh, I think I've always, before I was a lawyer, uh, wanted to help those that can't help themselves, mm -hmm. to help those that have been wronged uh, get the help they need to go forward. Uh, so I, I, I don't, I will just tell you, I really love trial work. I love getting up and, and telling a story uh, that is based on fact mm -hmm. and, and that conveys what someone's really been through. I think that uh, I love people and I think that with this particular role, I get to help people get better, mm -hmm. get treatment for their injuries and we give them an opportunity to tell all that they've been through and how this has affected them. Mm -hmm. I rode my car on the way to law school. I saved up for five years for that car mm -hmm. and had it for three days, hadn't even signed my insurance paperwork and rolled my car on the way to law school. Uh -huh. um, that was a traumatic experience that nobody seemed to understand how traumatic it was mm -hmm. to me. Because now if I rolled my car and I was fine or I appeared to be fine, it wouldn't be a big deal because I know how to handle it. Mm -hmm. But at that point, I had just left a job I just left my family. I just left all my friends. We didn't have cell phones really then. I know I didn't have one. And um, I really didn't know how, thank God for a credit card, but I really didn't know how I was going to get a replacement car. I had all kinds of issues with the insurance company. It just seemed so horrible. It took over three months for me to get a car. And if you've ever been to Lubbock, Texas, especially in 1996, um, there's really no, no such thing as an Uber. Cabs are scarce and very expensive. And um, you have to have a car to get around. Mm -hmm. So it was, uh, 
I like to help people and I like to fight for people that, that sometimes people don't want to fight for. And I will tell you that family law lawyers are by far my heroes because that might be the most difficult law I've ever encountered. I dappled in family law, I dappled in criminal, I dappled in traffic tickets initially because I took whatever walked in the door. And I quickly learned that criminal and personal injury was not so bad, but I really didn't want to do family law every day all day long. It's emotionally taxing. It takes a special person, I think. Thank, thank goodness for them. Yes. <laughs> Um, Thanks, for sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think I would just be broken hearted all the time. Um, so shout out to our family law friends, right? Yes. Um, what is there a case that stands out to you as one where you think back and, and, you know, remembering what you went through when you rolled your own car and how traumatic that was? Is there a case that stands out to you that makes you proud of the work that you do or that, you know, when you lay your head on the pillow, you think we did a good job there. Oh, there's so many cases really that, and initially I think I was really hard on myself and on my, my staff. I think, I always think we can do more, mm -hmm. but there's at least three cases that, that come to mind right now. One of them was a case that not one, not two, not three, not four, but five lawyers had withdrawn from or declined and we took it. And it was a, a gentleman that was, uh, he fell, slipped uh, at the mall in vomit and insurance company just kept denying it. And we made a demand and they denied it. So we filed suit and five and a half years later, we tried that case and we got him a verdict uh, that was far more than the initial level of, of coverage, mm -hmm. uh, but less than the, the maximum, the excess coverage. Yeah. And we settled it right before Christmas, um, four days after the trial. Mm -hmm. So I think, in fact, I don't think we actually got the jury verdict. We decided to settle it mm -hmm. when the verdict came out and then he got paid before Christmas. And that's what he wanted after five and a half years of waiting. Um, and his he was gay his partner was gay mm -hmm. um the defense attorney was not nice during trial we we stood up for him we treated him with respect uh, i think that others he felt like he finally was hurt because for five different lawyers for five different years he felt like nobody was hearing him and it may have been because he felt like he was in a marginalized group mm -hmm. it may be because you know nobody wants to take a slip and fall case or very few people do mm -hmm. um he had a partner who was lovely and they just they just really appreciated we became friends with them and it was a, a team effort we had a, a five of us at trial uh three lawyers and two assistants and and it we just became like family and they really appreciated having the opportunity to have someone listen to their story and be heard. Yeah. Um, and I think the verdict and ultimate settlement or the almost verdict and ultimate settlement was nice. Mm -hmm. But I think the fact that someone finally listened and believed mm -hmm. really made all the difference. Yeah. And how sweet that it came right before the holidays too. Yes, it was, it was a good thing. Um, Okay, as you get ready for your year as president of the Dallas Bar, can we get the inside scoop? What what can we expect from a Chrissy Castle presidency? Well, probably a lot of more of the same. Uh, I'm sure we're gonna do something to inspire and promote women and inspire and promote uh, the sister bars and inspire and promote uh, working together inclusiveness but i think ultimately the main goal of 2022 has to be to reopen and get back to living life mm -hmm. post or almost post pandemic mm -hmm. uh, so there's still a lot in the works um i know we're going to be calling on jennifer ryback uh and hope that you will step in especially in our women uh our programs highlighting women uh and looking at all different types of law we want to bring in all lawyers in the DFW Metroplex area, lawyers that haven't participated 
employers who maybe can't participate. Uh, we want to figure out how to make it a more inclusive bar. Although, as we all know, the Dallas bar is really inclusive and kind of does everything as, as well as anyone. Mm -hmm. So I don't know there's much that we can improve, but we definitely want to get more of our membership involved. And uh, hopefully to the mansion on Ross Street or whatever the name might be. Whatever it is, yeah. <laughs> well, there's two things I know about you for sure. And one is that you're inclusive and one is that you're fun. So I know we're looking forward to an inclusive and fun 2022 um, and hopefully with many, many, many more in-person events all together. Um, yeah, I let's cross our fingers, right? Um, <laughs> So as we close our, you know, conversation today, um, if you could give one piece of advice to the young women lawyers that may be watching and maybe they're thinking they want to start their own firm or, you know, they want to get involved and be a leader of a bar organization or they want to shake things up, what advice, what advice do you give them? Get involved. Join ask questions, do your research and dive in, just do it. And when you find yourself maybe not knowing what to do, call on your sisters and your brothers mm -hmm. for assistance because there's plenty of us out there that are willing to help. And you'd be surprised you're not the only one. Mm -hmm. Everybody has insecurities, everybody has doubts. Um, and most of us are pretty capable and most of us can do anything we set our minds to. I couldn't agree more. Girl, end on a girl power note. Um, well, thank you so much for sitting down with me, Chrissy. It's I always love talking to you, and I'm hoping the next time that we talk, we can have a glass of wine and uh, be together in person. But we appreciate your time. And um, from the Dallas Women Lawyers Association, thank you for joining us. Well, thank you. And as everyone knows, Jennifer, you are quite the rock star. Congratulations on your recent DAYL Outstanding Lawyer. Thank you. Yes, thank you. And I don't know who could be more of a superstar than you. You're a great mom. You're a great partner. Uh, awesome lawyer, a true friend, and such a great promoter woman. So thank you. And thank you, DWA. You know, my near and dear to my heart, DWA. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, you just, you know, highlighted one of the things that I love about you the most, which is that you are always, always supporting and cheering on women and men who are, you know, doing all the things that you have done throughout your career. So thank you for that. Um, and uh, thank you. We will, I'm sure, see each other soon. Yes. Thanks, Jennifer. Thank you.